All right. Um, so yeah, no disclosures as I begin. Um, uh, no, no financial conflicts of interest to report. I, you know, I do have um, currently clinical trials that are uh, looking at actually all three of our FDA approved medications, but none of them are, um, they're all sponsored by the National Institutes on Drug Abuse. Um, and uh, so nothing, no disclosures there to report. We'll start, you know, as these presentations often go with a little bit about the epidemiology, right? Opioids amongst youth. Then we'll go a little bit into kind of physical and psychological harms. Why, why is this harmful? Uh, looking at also part of the epidemiology, how the patterns have changed. And then we're going to go into treatments, uh, both what works and what are the gaps. So that's what all of that we'll try to cover in the next, hopefully, 18 minutes or so. So I'll start with youth and opioids, a little bit about epidemiology. And again, I haven't created more slides than I will cover in detail um, as reference. This is a very interesting um, paper that's looking at sort of the changing trends uh, in opioid use amongst youth, right? So here, the kind of the black line are, uh, is synthetic opioids other than methadone. Uh, so including things like oxycodone, for example, right? Um, you know, but then really getting into, um, well, sorry, really getting into high potency synthetic opioids. I think that's the big one this one covers. Uh, the blue line here is heroin, and these are the prescription opioids. I apologize. So we can see kind of similar to adults, right? You see uh, kind of prescription opioids um, rising. Uh, this is pediatric mortality rates, right? Stratified by opioids. So they kind of start rising here in 1999. This is when we also first noticed rates of um, opioid overdoses and emergency department visits related to prescription opioids rising in adults. So kind of youth mimic that pattern until we get to about 2008 or so, and then you see them falling off. Um, again, very similar to what we saw with adults, uh, folks 18 and over. Uh, I think part of what happened here is that as we gained awareness about rising rates of substance use disorders and emergency department visits and mortalities related um, possibly to overprescription of opioids, uh, many, many of us, right, many physicians, many clinicians started abruptly stopping prescribing this. And I think that had an unintended consequence, which is this rising rate of mortality related to heroin. So say I was seeing Dr. Jacobson and Dr. Jacobson had been giving me oxycodone for years and I developed an addiction to it. And Dr. Jacobson became aware that this was a problem and she abruptly stopped prescribing me oxycodone I went into withdrawals and I turned to the streets and found heroin. Uh, and this unfortunately happened to many of our patients. Uh, and Dr. Jacobson, I know that you were you are in no way responsible for that. Uh, just using you to illustrate a point. Uh, and we see kind of these rising rates of heroin overdose starting then. And then of course the third wave, which is our illicit fentanyl analogs or high potency synthetic opioids we really see how dramatically you can see these rates rose starting in about you know, 2013 or 2014 or so. Uh, and if you look at really between 1999 and 2016, we see 9,000 children and adolescents died from opioid overdose in the United States. And between those years, threefold increase in mortality. And if you just look at increase in mortality related to synthetic opioids, our illicit fentanyl analogs, you can see this dramatic number of almost 3,000% increase. Uh, and that really is something we continue to deal with. Um, here, we're looking at, again, kind of these rising rates to the left with opioids alone, but also com opioids combined with other substances. So increasingly, we are seeing opioids being used with stimulants, methamphetamines to be specific, um, certainly in adults and also in adolescents. Uh, and to the right is just a reference slide that looks at uh, the rates of various substances. In this slide, this is a nice paper from that was published in 2022 by Friedman looking at op adolescent overdose deaths between 2010 and 2021. And here, what I really want to draw attention to is the slide I have included on the right, which is overdose mortality among adolescents by race and ethnicity. Um, and you can see that between 2016 and 2021, so if you look at 2016, right, um, sort of everyone kind of congregates roughly together. But then look what's happened. Between 2016 and 2021, 
the rates of um, you know, opioid overdose mortalities amongst adolescents self-identified as American Indian or Alaska Native non-Hispanic has risen dramatically. And look at the second group that's really risen is the self-identified Latinx individuals, right? Between, and that you really start seeing to rising around 2019. Uh, and I think this probably can be its own and should be maybe its own presentation to really discuss this. But I, I, I point this out because certainly for us here in New Mexico, this should give us pause and this should make us concerned and it should make us reflect on what we're doing and what we're not doing to really start to address these increasing racial disparities that we're seeing. Um, this is a slide again, epidemiologically looking at youth opioid, uh, prescription opioid misuse. Um, and uh, I'm kind of gonna go forward here a little bit. Uh, New Mexico youth heroin use, uh, which has declined between 27 and 2019, but again, what's taken its place having illicit fentanyl analogs. So I wouldn't really start patting our backs simply looking at this slide. Uh, and the other thing of note here is that throughout this whole time period evaluated, um, New Mexico adolescents uh, are using heroin at rates higher than that of the US average. Um, and we see this with a variety of substances, uh, right? Unfortunately, uh, kind of gonna go forward here in the interest of time. Um, so why should this matter, right? And what we know is that in addition to just mortalities, which we often focus on and, and perhaps appropriately so, substance use in youth is correlated with a number of bad outcomes. And the worse the substance use, the worse these outcomes tend to be for our adolescents, right? So for example, this is going back to the days of DSM-4, uh, right, because this is an older study you can see done in back in 2008, uh, youth who met DSM-4 criteria for substance abuse, compared to those that did not, were more likely to be non-students. So they were just not um, going to school. Were more likely to have received services for psychological problems, reported worse health, and more likely to have a history of depression, right? And those that were dependent as, you know, those that had no symptoms, so those with more severe, what we would now call moderate to severe substance use disorder, were more likely to again have um, past year major depressive episode, sell illicit drugs, and use multiple drugs in the past year. So generally, their illnesses tend to be more severe um, beyond just uh, mortalities. Other things that have been noted, and this is from a much more recent paper from 2022, uh, more challenges with social determinants of health. Uh, so again, really pointing towards a multidisciplinary approach to taking care of our youth, working with and engaging communities in a meaningful way, um, and, and kind of that upstream prevention. Other substances, more mental health concerns, more trauma, more PTSD, more challenges with education, and challenges with employment have all been reported. Uh, so certainly important. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know we do a different talk on neurobiology, of addictions and substance use disorders, so won't spend too much time uh, other than to point out that both neurobiologically as well as socially, substance use impacts the normal development of adolescents, right? Including those trend, the transition uh, from education to employment, uh, relationships with family and peers, uh, increased legal consequences uh, have all been reported. So with all of that, now let's go into treatment. I'm just gonna glance at the time we're doing okay. Um, so unfortunately, you know, we often talk in this ECHO series and elsewhere about how we have effective treatments for opioid use disorders, but they're often not available to our patients when they need them, right? When they need that treatment, when they could benefit from treatment. And that's even more true when it comes to adolescents with opioid use disorders, right? Uh, so you can see here, so only, this is, um, you know, this, uh, you can see here that only, uh, and this is for paper from uh, 2017, that only about a quarter of youth over the age of 16 who had opioid use disorder were actually prescribed medications for opioid use disorder. And this increased with age, right? But if you look at, again, teens 16 to 17, less than 10% were given medications for opioid use disorder. So about 90% of youth ages 16 and 17 who had opioid use disorder did not receive these treatments. And again, going back to those racial ethnic disparities, medications most likely given to white males 
less medications provided for females, Blacks, and Hispanics. And this is from 2017, right? Uh, so we're doing much, much worse compared to adults when it comes to medications being available uh, for our youth. And again, these differences emerge. Um, and, uh, you know, and ideally, one of the principles of SAMHSA when it comes to treatment of substance use disorders, including opioid use disorders, is that treatment should be available in a timely fashion when the patient is ready, when the illness is identified. But this one study, again, from 2018, found that 76% of adolescents with a diagnosis of opioid use disorder received any treatment within three months of diagnosis, and only 5% of adolescents were prescribed buprenorphine, naltrexone, or methadone, right? So if you look at that timely three-month period, uh, only about 5% of adolescents actually received medication-based treatment within those critical three months. Lots of bad things can happen in that period. So uh, are medications effective? I guess that's the other, other sort of big point. So this is a classic study from 2008. And Dr. Nuremberg, who I saw is on, Dr. Nuremberg, uh, may remember this study. Um, UNM was certainly a part of it under Dr. Pat Abbott, uh, who at, at that point was the medical director of ASAP. Uh, was so we were UNM was one of the sites where they ran and this was sponsor, sponsored by National Institutes on Drug Abuse where they took 152 adolescents ages 15 to 21 so kind of the transitional age period everyone had opioid use disorder and they gave them 12 weeks of buprenorphine right so they the they, they stayed on buprenorphine for nine weeks and then were tapered by week 12 or they were just given two weeks of buprenorphine taper kind of this detox model right? Um, and what they found is at weeks four and eight, youth that were randomized to that 12-week buprenorphine maintenance condition. So these are youth who are maintained on buprenorphine at both of those points were less likely than those that underwent detox to submit opioid positive urines, 26 versus 61%. So pretty dramatic, right? And they were also more likely to be retained in treatment, 70% versus 20%. Again, very dramatic outcomes and outcomes that mimic the outcomes that we have for adults. Very similar outcomes showing that when buprenorphine was maintained in our youth, transitional age individuals, they were more likely to stay in treatment and less likely to use other illicit opioids compared to youth that were detoxified alone. So we know that medication treatment works for youth. And in that study, um, I haven't reviewed it in a full disclosure, at least in a couple of years. But, um, you know, uh, 26 of the youth were under the age of 18. And I believe the um, the, the youngest child uh, in that was 15 years um, in that study. So barriers to treatment with adolescents. So despite this, some barriers emerge. Stigma is a big one. Social family stigma. Confidentiality gets very, very tricky when it comes to treatment of minors, individuals under the age of 18. Legality, tying into that. Um, medical evidence, safety trials. We don't have nearly as much data for youth and adolescents as we do for adults. FDA approval of medications for opioid use disorder, which can also create a barrier um, to, in, uh, to being prescribed these medications. DEA regulations, which are thankfully lessening, and cost insurance coverage, which is an ongoing challenge. Okay. So talking about confidentiality, it gets very tricky. But I will point out that in New Mexico, children under the age of 14, right, um, can provide consent, the second bullet, for behavioral health treatments, including psychotropic medications and substance use treatment. So there is no, you know, so if someone is 14 and older, they don't need parental consent. However, it says parents or guardians must be notified, right? But then, so there is a notification law. Right, so they don't need consent, but notification should happen. But then uh, it says nothing in this section shall limit the rights of a child 14 or older to consent to services and to consent to disclosure of mental health records. So if notification becomes a problem, uh, the law goes on to state that that should not limit the rights of the child who's 14 or older right to receive the services. And the federal law then also states, this is for federally assisted programs. So any program that is receiving Medicaid funding, for example, which is many of us, 
that disclosure to parents may occur only if the minor lacks capacity for rational choice due to extreme youth, physical incapacity, or substantial threat to minor or another. So in general, the reading has been, and this is kind of what we've followed at ASAP, that if a child is 14 and older, of course we try to involve the parents. Of course we try to notify them and ideally engage them in the treatment of the youth. But if that's not available, we will not withhold the treatment uh, if it is evidence-based behavioral health treatment. Uh, these are some concerns that come up, right? For the adolescent, I can quit on my own. I don't do that anymore. I'm not addicted. My doctor gave them to me. And for the adults, there is often not my kid or they'll grow out of it, right? It's just replacing one drug for another. It might hurt their brain. And for providers, kind of things that this echo addresses, like what's an appropriate candidate? How is this going to affect my practice flow? What are the requirements legally through DEA, um, you know, et cetera. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our treatment options at this point. Um, so first key point is that the American Academy of Pediatrics has been very clear. They recommend that pediatricians consider offering medications for opioid use disorder to their adolescent patients who have opioid use disorder. We know, and this is just a summary slide that tells us everything we know about MOUD and youth, that all three of our FDA approved medications, so remember that's methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone, lead to improved treatment retention compared to no medications. Longer medication duration equals improved retention and reduced illicit opioid use, um, but there we don't have nearly as many studies as we do for adults. So when we think about these medications, again, much like for adults, we think about buprenorphine as the first line medication for individuals age 18 and you know under. It is approved for patients over the age of 16, but clinical trials, good quality clinical trials have gone, have looked at individuals as young as 12 years of age. So there is data available for buprenorphine for age 12 and older, but it is approved for patients who are 16 and older. Uh, it is open, it says as young as 13, but there is actually studies out there that look at 12. So, um, you know, I, you know, I, that slide needs to be revised, which I will do. Um, I just noticed it, apologies about it. Often considered to be the first choice. And again, we know treatment retention improves and illicit opioid use goes down. And abstinence actually goes up and longer treatment equals better outcomes. I've actually included some of the major studies. One thing I will point out, is that in all of these seminal studies looking at buprenorphine treatment for individuals 18 and younger, there is a robust psychosocial arm, a robust therapy condition, uh, usually including uh, medication management as well as cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, so that is included uh, in here. Um, so we don't really have good quality studies that look at just medication in the youth. For methadone, laws are tricky. Um, you know, and this thankfully is going away. Uh, and in, you know, and in, in a matter of months, the law traditionally has been that if someone's under the age of 18 and I want to start them on methadone, I have to document two unsuccessful attempts at short-term detox or non-medication treatment. And many of us have pushed back against it for years, right? Saying this is not evidence-based. This actually creates barriers to treatment. Uh, and thankfully, this requirement was done away with SAMHSA, and now all the states are working on implementing this. So this will be going away. Um, you know, uh, parental or guardian consent required and must be dispensed from an opioid treatment program. So that has not changed. But we again know that uh, when people um, are on methadone, they use less illicit opioids and they stay in treatment. And this is a really nice new study from 2018, newer study, I should say that those receiving methadone were about 68% less likely than those receiving behavioral services only to discontinue treatment during the follow-up period. Um, and um, again, this is some of the methadone studies. Naltrexone doesn't have nearly as much data. Much like methadone, it's also approved for patients 18 and older. Uh, it appears to be safe and feasible, but it is of course harder to initiate and the data is lacking. Um, and these are, you know, this was a study from 2019 that actually compared, reviewed the studies that have compared methadone, naltrexone, and buprenorphine. Basically, what we find is that all three are effective, but methadone likely has better treatment retention compared to buprenorphine or naltrexone, which is something we find in adults as well. 
Now I come to psychosocial interventions. So again, in youth, um, good quality studies that involve medication alone for opioid use disorder are lacking. They all have combined psychosocial intervention. I've listed the major ones here, uh, but this may pose a barrier to access. And I will point out that psychosocial interventions are not effective by themselves, but may improve outcomes when combined with one of our FDA approved medications. These are just reference slides that I'm not gonna go into. Uh, ACR stands for Adolescent Community Reinforcement Approach. A lot of research on this has been done right here in New Mexico at CASA at the University of New Mexico. Uh, really seems to work. And we try to incorporate this when we're working with adolescents uh, at our clinic. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. CM stands for Contingency Management. And I know uh, SOAR Project under Julie's leadership has done trainings for contingency management, which is a very evidence-based treatment for a variety of substance use disorder. And I think, again, always remember, involving the family can be particularly important in adolescent substance abuse treatment. Anticipate and manage re, uh, manage uh, relapse. Kind of moving forward, I will end with this. This was an interesting study just from 2021, where they combined extended release buprenorphine, so that's the injectable buprenorphine, right? or injectable naltrexone uh, with home delivery of medication, right? Looking at the barriers youth face, getting to the clinic, often having significant other who's also using opioids, uh, right? Uh, having you know, sort of these practical barriers to treatment. So they started this youth on extended release medications and they ensured like that we were doing home delivery. So someone was going to where they were staying and giving them the medicine there, the injection there. They were treating the significant other and also providing con contingency management and assertive outcome um, outreach. And what they found is that treatment retention improved significantly. The intervention is this line, and uh, the gray line is the treatment as usual, the TAU. And you can see that as early, uh, you know, and this is looking at time to relapse. So even when you look at in weeks, right? So even at 24 weeks, you can see the significant difference that emerged between the conditions. So again, Combining some of these approaches can improve outcomes. And integration is the key. Integrating with pediatric care, case management, social work, supporting education, more flexible hours, right, are all important. More research is still necessary. Uh, and creating ultimately a youth-friendly treatment system, right, a broader individualized approach, integrated treatment, um, kind of genuine care and support. Adolescents are very tuned into that. Are you being authentic? Are you not being authentic? Right, and uh, recognizing, identifying and addressing barriers as they emerge are all critical. And I've included some resources and I will stop here. Thank you.